I'm Dan kurtz and this is the Foreign Affairs Interview. I worry increasingly that the United States will not only not be able to set an example that others will want to emulate, but that the United States will not have the focus and the consistency that has served us and the world extraordinarily well for three quarters of a century. There have been a lot of essays in foreign affairs in the past hundred years declaring that the world is at some kind of inflection point. But now we're in a time when that claim seems especially plausible. Great power tensions are rising, even as new common threats demand cooperation, and America remains mired in political division and dysfunction. As Richard Haas, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, argues in a new essay, this is shaping up to be a very dangerous decade, and it's far from clear that U.S. foreign policy is up to the task. Richard, thanks for doing this. Great to be with you, Dan. So this comes just after we've officially marked our 100th birthday. So it's appropriate that we have the president of the Council on Foreign Relations here with us. I think you look really good for someone who just turned 100, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate that. We're still uh, sprightly. But more relevant to this conversation is that you've got a big piece in our September, October issue. It's called The Dangerous Decade, but it's just the latest in a long string of FA pieces starting long before you were in this current job. The first one was in 1995. I want to talk about a number of those pieces for the magazine, but let's start with the most recent one. You call this the most dangerous decade. You've worked in government through some of the more nail-biting moments of the Cold War. You were there during the Gulf War, during the Iraq War. Why do you see this moment as so uniquely dangerous given that history? Dan, I'd argue the current moment ought to give anyone and everyone pause. And it is uniquely dangerous because of the sheer volume of things that are going on in their range. And I would highlight three buckets. One is the bucket of geopolitical revival. We obviously have the situation in Europe, a revanchist Russia, the war in Ukraine. We've got China not just rising, but in some ways facing real problems. And the question is whether the nationalist card will be at some point played by a more capable China. Iran, whether Iran and the United States and others get back into the 2015 agreement, either way, you have an Iran that is an imperial power regionally and has nuclear ambitions that will not be permanently restrained by the agreement, regardless of whether it's revived. So you've got three geographies of serious geopolitics. Then at the global level, you have this enormous gap, certainly in the area of climate. We saw it in the area of pandemics, infectious disease. You see it in cyberspace. You see it in proliferation. You've got a gap in every one of these areas between the scale of the threat and the efficacy of the machinery. People like to use the phrase international community. There isn't one. If there were one, you wouldn't have this gap. It's about that simple. And then thirdly, against these two challenges to what I would call the traditional world order, the geopolitical order, and the globalization order, you've got the fact that the United States, which for three quarters of a century has played this outsized role in managing, leading, ordering the world, we have increasingly lost our enthusiasm and capacity for the job. We're simply too distracted, too divided at home. And the one thing you learn in high school science, but we also learn from studying history, is order is not the natural state of things. Systems do not come together simply by themselves if left to their own devices. The opposite's the case. And I worry increasingly that the United States will not only not be able to set an example that others will want to emulate, but that the United States will not have the focus and the consistency that has served us and the world extraordinarily well for three quarters of a century. And when you add up these three separate dimensions or dynamics, revived geopolitics, this global gap, and a preoccupied, divided United States, that's what led to the article. And I am genuinely worried. And I'm worried, though, for a purpose. I I want people to feel compelled to do something about it, that it's not just going to sort itself out. It's not simply going to end well if left alone. And the United States and others have to react to this set of challenges. We have to react in our foreign policy. And obviously, we need to react here at home. I want to start with the third piece of that, the role of the United States. Mm -hmm. You've been writing about the state of American foreign policy and American statecraft Again, since you were publishing those early articles in Foreign Affairs, you've, through most of that period, deplored the state of American statecraft. And you say again in this most recent piece that the task for U.S. policymakers, and I'm quoting you here, is to rediscover the principles and practice of statecraft. The record of that over the last three or four decades does not look particularly good. 
what to your mind has been at the core of this problem in American foreign policy? Why have we not figured this out despite all of the advantages we seem to have had coming into the post-Cold War period when you were, again, working in American foreign policy and writing some of these pieces? The record of the last three decades is really poor. If I were going to write a book about these three decades, one way or another, the word squander would be in the title. We really have squandered the opportunity. Think of where we were three decades ago at the end of the Cold War. We had a degree of primacy that was really unprecedented. The United States had good relations with the soon-to-be former Soviet Union. We already had a pretty good relationship with China for two decades at that point. We handled extraordinarily well the end of the Cold War. We handled, I'd like to say, extraordinarily well, full disclosure, I was part of it, the Gulf War. So the post-Cold War period got launched with about as good a setup as one could ever hope for. Three decades later, talk about a geopolitical or foreign policy bear market. We have lost uh, tremendous ground here, and it wasn't inevitable. The fact that others were going to rise did not mean that order had to plummet. Others rose in the aftermath of World War II. Indeed, we designed the redistribution of power after World War II. It was a conscious goal of American foreign policy to reduce our primacy, but to do it in a constructive way, to rebuild defeated countries, to build institutions and lock them into these institutions. There's nothing of the sort. I think it's been institutionally poor the last three decades. And it's hard to argue that we haven't mishandled relations with both Russia and China, albeit they themselves also bear some of the responsibility for the poor state of things. The lack of progress on global issues to me shows at times a real lack of focus, a real lack of priority. So it's both the things we haven't done and the things we've done. I think we've also overreached in the Middle East. Indeed, Dan, if we had had this conversation three years ago, it would have been inconceivable that either one of us would have predicted that so many of the calories of the United States, our time, our resources, our energy, our dollars, our lives, would have been so dedicated to the greater Middle East as though that was the pivotal region in the world that was going to shape 21st century history. Inconceivable. I think critics of U.S. foreign policy in this period who are in the broad restraint camp, and you're not usually associated with that camp, but you were in government in Bush 43 during the early stages of the Iraq war. You were seeing your internal opponent or skeptic of the war. You were critic of the war after leaving. I think a lot of people in that restraint camp point to Iraq as kind of the major sin in this period. It was what led to our overinvestment in the Middle East. It caused our kind of distraction from these bigger kind of great power challenges, discredited our leadership in the international system. You hear some of the uh, skeptics of the U.S. position on Ukraine still citing Iraq back to us and explaining why they see our reaction as hypocritical. How much of this is really just the Iraq war? I think that's an overstatement. One could be and should be properly critical of the Iraq war, but I don't think the Iraq war in any way explains, justifies the flaws in American foreign policy towards the former Soviet Union and Russia, towards China. I could go around the world. So I think that's too easy. What I think it did do, though, is it created a certain alienation from foreign policy, that foreign policy was seen perhaps by a younger generation as causing more damage than gain. It obviously created impetus or added to the impetus of a kind of, I don't know if it's isolationism, that's too strong of a word, but a distancing of the United States from the world. And historically, overreach leads to underreach. And I think what we've now had in some ways, certainly in the Obama administration, we had clear underreach in places like Syria after the articulation of the red line in places like Iraq. We had underreach at times in the Trump administration in many ways. We've also seen some of it in Afghanistan in this administration. So I do think there was some reaction to the overreach, not just of Iraq, but, but Afghanistan. But also possibly it might have been a natural reaction. If you think about it, take a step back. After the end of the Cold War, the general sense was that we had earned the right to put our feet up a little bit, that after four decades of nonstop American leadership and exertion, there was the hope for the so-called peace dividend. And I think that trend was already there. And the Iraq war may have exacerbated that or reinforced that, but I don't think it created it. When you look across these three administrations, Obama, Trump, and now Biden, there's a consensus about the need to do less to reduce American exposure in the Middle East. 
do you see an overcorrection in that direction at this point? Is there any chance of getting the balance right when you look at this set of challenges and relationships there? There's a chance, but you wouldn't want to bet on it. The United States and the Middle East tends to do too much or too little. You're right, though. I'm not fighting the premise that there has been a sense, coming back to what we were just talking about, to reduce the overreach in the Middle East, getting out of Afghanistan, reducing our footprint in the Syrias and Iraqs. The problem is that Iran is not a status quo country. It's something of an imperial country. It's not as though the Middle East is going to go away in terms of its energy importance. The thinking about the Middle East and about energy has been really flawed. The hopes that the energy transition would render the Middle East of secondary import, the timelines have been way, way off. You've written several good articles in the magazine, Jason Bordoff and Megan O'Sullivan, about the fossil fuel reality is going to be with us for decades and longer. So people were too willing to write off the Middle East too soon. You still have terrorism. We learned that the hard way two decades ago. We still have commitments to Israel. So to me, where the administration's got it wrong was not thinking through how to right-size the Middle East. Too much of an emphasis on downsizing, not enough of an emphasis on right-sizing, too much of a preoccupation with spreading democracy, not enough with order, I think, unrealistic hopes about Iran and about what the 2015 agreement could accomplish. And we simply don't have the luxury, I think, of ignoring that geography. That's why this is coming back to where we began our conversation. We've got a three geography in a heavy geopolitical sense, reality with us for some time to come, the Middle East, Europe, and Asia. That's what makes this so demanding. Early part of my career, I worked in the Pentagon in the 70s. And there was all this talk about two war strategies and one and a half and two and a half war strategies and the rest. Well, right now, we need a three war strategy. We need a three geography strategy. I would argue that among other things, the national security and defense budgets aren't even in the right zip code to deal with that. You know, The good news is that historically, we spent far more as a percentage of GDP than we're spending now. The bad news is our politics aren't there. And we've got a set of commitments that are far outpacing our capabilities. If you add up these three geographies, it's again, what makes this such a pressing time. But the Middle East is going to have to play an ongoing or it's going to be a reality of American foreign policy. And I think the if we overreached under the Bush 43 administration, the danger for three administrations in a row now is we've underreached. And we've got to figure out a sustainable level of effort in the Middle East. And that's a question both of effort, but also of goals. I do not think transformation of the Middle East is a realistic foreign policy goal for the United States. You see a similar dynamic in some ways when it comes to Asia, this kind of going back and forth between extremes of policy, and that's especially true of China. China is also an area of perhaps surprising continuity, surprising to some, between the Trump and Biden administrations. You could look at this dynamic over the last 25 or 30 years and see outsized hopes about what we would get out of the China relationship, whether it was China's liberalization at home or its economic behavior or its foreign policy that have given way to really kind of dark competitive impulses on both sides. Do you see similar overcorrection when it comes to China policy? The short answer is I do. We were probably unrealistic about what we hoped for, but I worry about some of the current consensus. You know, people people in our business always call for bipartisanship. And sometimes I sit back and go, be careful what you wish for. The current bipartisanship on China seems to me almost too muscular. It doesn't seem to allow enough of an overture just as another example of bipartisanship, we have bipartisanship on trade. And I think it's a really destructive bipartisanship because I can't find very many people who see the benefits of trade. But you asked about China going forward. I think there's potentially some opportunity there. And I understand all the challenges that China poses. And Xi Jinping's China is not the China we bargain for. It's more repressive. It's more statist economically. It's obviously more assertive and capable in its foreign policy. But also Xi Jinping, as he begins his third term, has an inbox that no one should want. If one looks at the range of economic and demographic and environmental challenges and health challenges China faces, it is as unenviable as it gets. You've run a lot of articles just recently about China's uh, economic challenges. A lot of them are self-created, what have you, but they're real all the same. The danger, obviously, is at some point, Xi Jinping and the Communist Party may turn to nationalism and foreign adventure as the outlet, as a way of maintaining a bond with the Chinese people. This replaces economic performance, potentially, as the source of legitimacy for the party. We obviously don't want them to get to that point. 
I would say there's something of a diplomatic opening here. Shouldn't the United States try to work out with China some rules of the road? China's not provided, as best I know, military help to Russia. Okay, that tells me something. China's worried about sanctions. China's economy right now is vulnerable. This is not a moment China wants to encounter economic sanctions. So the question is, could we potentially work some things out with China? Maybe there. China's suffering from terrible drought. Are there some possibilities in the climate? We could go around the world. China can't be happy that North Korea is shooting missiles over Japan. If you read the papers, Japan is now about to embark, potentially, not just on defense military modernization, but potentially build offensive systems of its own. That cannot be good for China. So I look at all this and I go, are there not some strategic openings here that the United States should explore? We have to get comfortable with the idea, certainly with China, even with Russia, it's harder with Russia, that we are going to have a relationship that's not going to be one-dimensional or single personality. It's going to have, if you will, various elements. So I can imagine with China that, yes, we have competitive, even adversarial dimensions of our policy, and we've got to, among other things, make sure that China's never tempted to use military force against Taiwan. We've got to build up militarily and so forth. But, and it's an important but, we should also be exploring various avenues of cooperation with China. And the reason this is so hard in foreign policy terms, it's so much less difficult to explain and maintain one-dimensional relationships. They're all positive or they're all negative. But where on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you cooperate, and on Wednesdays and Fridays, you have competition or worse, that's really tough. Puts much more of a premium on diplomatic skill. I hope we're up to it. I hope they're up to it. But that's the challenge for the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways, key parts of this administration have articulated a similar objective, but have had a hard time figuring out how to achieve the cooperation amid a broad environment of competition. Jake Sullivan and Kurt Campbell wrote that on our pages a few years ago, and they're presumably still trying to do some version of that. If you were helping them prepare for the meeting between Biden and Xi Jinping in a couple of months, where do you see that opportunity? How would you kind of construct that strategy? Well, exactly. I would, among other things, begin to talk about this in public. I think too much of the public conversation is one dimensional about China. You have to sometimes prepare space domestically in order to operate in a space internationally. I would also, whether it's Jake Sullivan or some other figure with whoever will be his new Chinese counterpart, needs to have these kinds of conversations. We don't have strategic conversations. The way the administration began with this first meeting, was it Hawaii? In uh, Anchorage. Oh, in Anchorage, right. Got my 49th and 50th states confused there. With the public scolding of China? I mean, what kind of, that was ridiculous. That's not diplomacy. We need to have serious private conversations with China. And we need to also look for some areas where we can realistically have what you might call limited successes. And that ought to be the assertion. We ought to set some guardrails. And among other things on Taiwan, I don't think you can have a successful relationship with China that doesn't somehow, not solve, but manage Taiwan. Taiwan has been a brilliant example of diplomatic finesse for nearly half a century. And the question is, how do we extend it? I've argued in your pages with David Sachs that we can and should articulate a policy of strategic clarity, but also make clear it is 100% consistent with support for the notion of you know, the three communiques and one China and all that. This is a unilateral policy about how we would go about implementing it, but we still want to make sure that Taiwan does not become a casus belli that would undermine what is and will be the single most significant relationship of this era of history. Well, that's the conversation we ought to be having with China about what they're doing, because they have clearly moved their baseline in the aftermath of the visit by uh, the Speaker of the House. They are now doing things in military exercises that they didn't do before. We have got to have a serious conversation with them about, if you will, resetting the rules of the road on Taiwan, but also beyond that about the larger relationship. That can't be done in public. That's got to be done in private. I think there's a limit to what the presidents can do. So you need to have trusted lieutenants doing it in the way that Henry Kissinger and Joe and Lai did it four or five decades ago. But that's where we are. We'll be back after a short break. Alumni call it transformative. Employers call it invaluable. Fletcher's hybrid Global Master of Arts program allows mid-senior level career professionals to earn an Executive Master of Leadership in Global Affairs in just one year without leaving the workforce. 
Learn from Fletcher's world-renowned experts and practitioners while studying in a cohort of fellow professionals from around the world. Graduate with essential skills and a lifelong global network. Fletcher's GMAP. Find us online and reach out to learn more. We could spend the next half hour talking about strategic clarity, though I would note that the president seems to have more or less endorsed that policy, even if- I don't know if he read the article four times, but he's articulated it four times. That's right, that's right. (laughs) But let's talk a bit about Ukraine, which is still the kind of dominant story in American foreign policy right now. There's a striking contrast you draw near the beginning of the most recent article where you note the difference in the world's response to Saddam's invasion of Kuwait in 1991 and Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022 which of course had a much less united response than we were able to put together in that first post-Cold War moment. How do you think the administration is doing on Ukraine? And as you look to what still seems to be a long and grinding battle, even with recent Ukrainian successes, what the hard questions are going to be for U.S. foreign policy going forward? To make a long story short, I think the administration deserves pretty high marks on Ukraine. This has been a really good example of their alliance first approach to not just the region, but to the world. It's forward. They've also set limits on our involvement. You know, the president always talks about the need to avoid World War III. So it's not unconditional, unlimited, but it's significant support for Ukraine economically and militarily. And this is all on behalf of what you alluded to, which is the norm that territory ought not to be acquired by force. You know, there are not a lot of rules in this world of ours. That's about as close as you come to a foundational rule. And without it, I shudder to think what would happen in places like Asia or the Middle East. So I think it's important. It goes beyond Ukraine. It's not about democracy. It really is about order. And I wish the administration would stop couching this in democratic terms, which among other things leads them to forfeit some of the international support they might otherwise get. Every country in the world has a stake in secure borders. Every country in the world, unfortunately, does not have a stake in democracy. Many of them happen to see it as a threat. But that's an aside. I think going forward... The administration faces a couple of um, tough decisions. One is this question of, and they're related, by the way. One is the question, how do you deter Russian escalation? Now, we're seeing some forms of escalation, potentially what we saw with the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipelines. We're now seeing renewed attacks on civilian areas inside Ukraine. I do not think we will see escalation against NATO. Hard to imagine how a Russian military that can't succeed against Ukraine is going to take on NATO. I just... Don't see the logic of that. The fear is obviously escalation to some type of nuclear use, whether it's a test blast or something else. I think that's, I can't dismiss that. I find it unnerving that Vladimir Putin has deinstitutionalized Russia to the degree he has. So I can't sit here in this conversation with you and tell you confidently what he can and cannot do if he wanted to. Meaning he on a whim can say, I want to launch a tactical nuke and a desperate, if his forces are getting routed in the south and east of the country, might he do it in order to basically get Europe or Ukraine or the United States to pause in their support? Possible. Oil and energy don't seem to have done that. He hasn't given up on that. But it may be that he thinks that certainly the threat of nuclear use might do that. Whether he thinks the actuality of nuclear use in some form would do the same thing. I think he's wrong if he thinks that. But I can't tell you he doesn't think that. And I also can't sit here and tell you he couldn't get away with it if he wanted to. So I think one challenge for the administration is how do you discourage Mr. Putin or others around him from going down this path? And what I've talked about publicly and privately is to be very specific about our threats. Obviously, we wouldn't match them in kind with nuclear use or chemical use of our own. But I do think we would remove some of the constraints on either what we're prepared to do indirectly to help Ukraine or what we might be prepared to do ourselves in using conventional military forces. This has been up heretofore what you might call an indirect war for us. The question is, if Russia were to escalate, might it become, say, a direct war, we would introduce air power into the Ukraine theater. So I think there's those questions, and we ought to communicate that to the Russians. The other half, I think, of the questions going forward is this issue of war aims. Does the United States sign on to what's increasingly become Ukraine's war aims? This combination of Ukraine military advance and atrocities, but the war itself, which is a violent atrocity, as well as specific atrocities, as we've seen in places like Bucha and other cities more recently, has clearly led the Ukrainian leadership to up their war aims. Every square inch of territory, going back to essentially 1991 borders, accountability for war crimes, compensation, reparations for what's happened. 
And the question is, do we sign on to them? Well, the administration has been reluctant to put itself at cross purposes with Ukraine. And essentially, you and I were recently there in Kyiv, and you had Jake Sullivan and others essentially saying our war aims are pretty much what the Ukrainian leadership defines them to be. Well, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. I can understand how we don't want to necessarily have a public conversation about this, but in private, I think we need something of a serious dialogue with the Ukrainian about war aims, about diplomacy, about whether there's ever a point for interim arrangements that we can sign on to the goal that Ukraine ought to be intact. The question is, what tools are used to bring that about? What are the timelines? What do we ask sanctions to do? What do we ask military force to do? I think this is a more nuanced, complicated conversation. You know, before I talked about the need for a strategic dialogue with China, arguably a strategic dialogue with Russia, possibly a strategic dialogue with Ukraine. This is a moment of potentially intense diplomacy. And how would you define those war aims if you were involved in those conversations? Is it going back to February 24th? Is there any, I mean, getting Crimea back in the near term seems somewhat fanciful, but Ukrainians have, you know, some reason for asserting that as a war aim. How would you set those limits? Look, it's a big question. It's a tough question. I'm a little bit hesitant to say this ought to be the ultimate war. I think ultimately you want to have a situation that Russia accepts Ukraine. Take a step back. What began this war was not a territorial question. It was really a more existential question. So we need a Russian government. And there's a legitimate question whether this government can be trusted to do it. And a lot of people in Ukraine would say not, that would accept Ukraine and a Ukraine that's willing to associate itself and be integrated in the West, in the EU, potentially NATO. But that's what I want. I want a Ukraine that is integrated ultimately and accepted as by Russia as integrated in the West. That seems to me the largest concern. Could there be some territorial adjustments? Could there be special status areas? Like I've spent a lot of my life dealing with special status areas, not successfully, I should point out, but I was the US envoy to Cyprus talks in the 80s. I was the US envoy to Northern Ireland. I've been involved in any number of years of Middle Eastern talks, of Kashmir talks, the idea of shared sovereignty, degrees of autonomy, and so forth. There are all sorts of formulas for dealing, I think, with Crimea, with those areas and the Donbass that have high percentage of Russian ethnics. That's one of the reasons God created diplomats, to come up with arrangements to deal with these situations. So I think that's all potentially on the table. The first order question, I would think, though, is to get a Russian government that Ukraine is willing to work with. Just right now, we've only got one Russian government, this one. And the question is, that would accept Ukraine's right to exist and to associate. And then I think that's the core. Then we can build out all the territorial questions and all the special status issues. Would you, if you were in government now, start quiet negotiations with the Russians immediately? Do you think it's worth having those going, even if there's little hope of them being successful in the near term? I would have a larger conversation with the Russians. I don't think history is well served, or the future is well served, by a Russia that's totally alienated from the world. So I would certainly be willing to have a dialogue with Putin about the full range of US-Russia relations. We've got, for example, all the strategic nuclear questions. And increasingly, the arms control framework is inadequate to the task. There's North Korea. There's Iran. Russia's party to that. The Russian-Iranian relationship is increasingly problematic, given Iranian arms transfers to Russia. There's been recent reports about new outbreaks of a COVID variant in Russia. So Russia as a pariah, outside of all the institutions of the world, seems to me, I understand the desire for it, given how abominably Russia's acted, how unacceptably it's acted in Ukraine. But the question is, can we compartmentalize it all? And I would, maybe the answer is no, I don't know. But I would certainly say we need to have a dialogue with Putin's Russia. And we may conclude that nothing can come of it. But I don't think it makes sense to signal Russia that nothing they could do would make a difference. Well, my view is to keep open the possibility, not of necessarily full integration, no one's going to forget, no one's going to forgive but whether one can have at least some limited areas of cooperation against the backdrop of fundamental disagreement. Russia still has you know, the world's largest nuclear arsenal. It has obviously much less than we thought of, you know, but still in terms of capability, conventional forces. It is the ability to affect any number of regional questions. So I don't believe that diplomacy is a favor. I don't believe that that kind of interaction 
is something that should be withheld as a sanction. And I'd say the same thing about North Korea or Cuba. Diplomacy is a tool of national security. We ought to use it. Now, depending upon how we employ it, how the other side reacts, we may decide this is a tool that can actually produce some benefits. Great. If not, so be it. At least we've explored it. But it is in and of itself, diplomacy is simply a tool, no more, no less. It's not a positive. It's not a negative. It's simply an instrument to be explored and to be employed. A huge part of the U.S. response to Ukraine has focused on sanctions. You wrote, I believe, your second ever foreign affairs piece in 1997 called Sanctioning Madness, which is about the overuse of sanctions. You wrote back then, the growing use of economic sanctions to promote foreign policy objectives is deplorable. Since then, foreign affairs has run probably dozens of pieces that have also highlighted the limits of sanctions and the potential blowback of sanctions, including from people like Jack Lew, the former Treasury Secretary. Why does this continue to be such a preferred tool of American foreign policy, despite what seems to be a consensus in this analysis that they don't really work? And is anything about the sanctions announced in response to first the Russian troop buildup around Ukraine and then the Russian invasion surprised you? Is Do you see any promise of success here that we've missed in the past? I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in where option one was essentially diplomacy or do very little. Option three was go to war. Option two was the reasonable middle course of economic sanctions. It is the don't just stand there, do something preferred option of uh, foreign policy bureaucracies. And we have employed it with abandon. And when administrations feel compelled to do something, but they don't want to use military force, my hunch is we've overused it tactically in way too many situations. We've also overused it you know, strategically, I think, in terms of certain ambitious aims. My own take on sanctions is they can do some limited good. They do not tend to succeed if your goals are ambitious or short term. They almost never succeed. They have all sorts of effects that may be unintended. Now, sanctions have gotten a bit smarter over the years, more tailored, more narrow, and we've been better able to marshal what you might call fairly significant financial sanctions. So uh, I think the instruments evolved to some extent. But again, look at the Russia case, unprecedented sanctions, yet Russia's selling tons of energy. It's found all sorts of markets. And sanctions have had the bizarre effect at times where it's become more difficult for Russia to sell things. It's forced the price up. It's almost Newtonian. For every action, there is an equal and opposite Reaction. But the idea that sanctions are going to deliver Russia or deliver Iran on the nuclear thing, no, they don't do that. And the only reason they worked the most successful case in the history of sanctions is South Africa. But there you had a society where an important element of the society wanted sanctions to succeed because they wanted South Africa, one, to get out from under apartheid, and two, to be integrated in the world. Well, you don't have that in a place like Russia. You don't have that in repressive societies like Iran. Or if you do have it in terms of the middle class at the moment in Iran, they're not yet able to call the shots. Maybe one day they hopefully will. So I think sanctions can be a piece of the strategy, but no more. Before we wrap up, I want to turn to the third big risk that you highlight in the most recent piece. And it's one that you seem to think is in some ways the most difficult or scariest. And that's what's happening in our own country. You write, as problems new and old collide and combine to challenge the U.S.-led order, perhaps the most worrisome changes are taking place inside the United States itself. It's hard to be optimistic about the course of our political system, you know, without getting into 2024 speculation, you can imagine candidates who deny the validity of elections or question some of these core tenets of our own democracy in certain ways. Do you see a path to repair here? Do you have any hope that this pillar can hold or is that danger going to grow and grow kind of overwhelming all of these foreign policy questions we have? I do see a path, but to borrow from something I said about the world, good things don't just happen. The United States will not go down this path towards preserving and improving its democracy. It won't just happen. It'll only happen because people make it happen. It's not, though, going to happen from the top. That's the conclusion I've reached. The idea that some political figure is going to come along and he or she is going to single-handedly lead us into the promised land or back to the promised land of American democracy after two and a half centuries, I don't think that's the way it's going to work. I think it's going to have to come from the bottom up. If I may be allowed a shameless plug, the reason I've written the book that's coming out in January, this book, The Bill of Obligations, is because I have concluded that if the problem is us, using the old Pogo cartoon, the solution is also us. 
And by that, I mean in voting. Why is it that roughly 60% of Americans don't bother to show up at the polls for midterm elections? Why do 40% of Americans not bother to vote in presidential elections? Why do most Americans not bother to know what's going on in the news? Why do most kids who go to high schools and colleges graduate, get their diplomas, and not one of them or very few of them have taken courses in civics, even though in many cases those courses are offered? Why is so much of what appears on news not news? And I could go down the list. And so I think there are all sorts of things that can and should be done. There's no single answer, but there's things that parents can do. Ronald Reagan said that the most important thing in America is what parents tell their kids at the dinner table. More than 100 million Americans every week go to a house of worship. Well, people who stand up and preach and give sermons can talk about the importance of civility. They can reject the use of violence for political ends. They can delegitimize certain types of activities without getting into the policies of the moment. So there are things we can and should do in schools. Parents who are shelling out enormous sums of money, so Mary or Johnny go to private school or go to college, why can't they insist that part of that education is something to do with civics? So I think there are things that can and should be done, but it's going to have to come from the ground up. I've not given up on it because to give up on the possibility is to give up on American democracy. Let me close by posing to you a version of a question that we posed to our regular book reviewers in our most recent issue. We asked each of them to recommend a few books, most essential to understanding the past century, and then a few most essential to understanding the century ahead, leaving aside your own books, which you've already had an opportunity to plug. What would you, what would you put on that list, especially that latter list for understanding what's to come? I've got a couple of books that have served me really well. The single book that's had the biggest influence on my thinking about foreign policy and international relations is a book by an Australian academic by Headley Bull, The Anarchical Society. And the title tells you everything you need to know, that order in the world at any one time is the play between forces of anarchy and forces of society. Society meaning rules. Anarchy, obviously, people understand what that is. And in history, at any point, you don't have one or the other. You have a balance between the two. But what foreign policy is about is obviously trying to promote rules and observance of those rules in the world. So I find that the single most useful framing concept for international relations. Now, it's a serious book. It's not light reading. But I would say for anyone who's starting out in the field or for any graduate student in the field, this is one of the classics. I also get a lot out of Henry Kissinger's first book, A World Restored, because there was an attempt of the statesman of the era to come up with the precepts of international relations. The fact that it was his doctoral dissertation, though, is depressing that anyone could be so good at such an early stage of his career. It's also a book with wonderful character portraits of Talleyrand and Castlereagh and Metternich. It's a wonderful read. What Kissinger does so well, he goes back and forth between a description and analysis. Now, it's not a book about prescription, which also is part of our business. For that, I would go to a book by two former colleagues of mine, Dick Neustadt and Ernie May, Thinking in Time and the Use of History for Decision Makers. History is the best thing that's out there as a backdrop to what you and I have been talking about. You know, look, we're not talking about recipes. This isn't a cookbook, but I don't know of any place to go for more insight, usable, relevant insight than history. That's the best we can come up with in our field. And what I like about the book by uh, Neustadt and May is it gives you a lot of guidance on the do's and don'ts of using history. You know, not every compromise is Munich and appeasement, but some might be. And how do you think that through? The last thing I'd recommend, I'm going to give you a shameless plug, is go to Foreign Affairs, both the hardcover, but also the website. This is just regular, serious, but also accessible analysis of what is going on in the world. And also a lot of it includes some history analysis, but also prescription. A lot of people are putting forth their ideas. And as a regular diet, you would be hard pressed to do better. So, you know, I would say to people, if you are a regular consumer, there's no house policy. There's no foreign affairs school of thought about what to do about Ukraine or what to do about China and Taiwan or Iran or anything else. But what you will get is a good range of informed views that will draw on history, that will give you serious analysis, often will give you prescription, whether you buy it or not, and it will help you and then come to your own position. And that to me is the purpose of a serious magazine or journal, is to help you come to work out your own more informed position 
And that's why I think it's such an important publication. Well, that's a great note to end on. Richard, thanks very much for doing this. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening. You can find the articles that we discussed on today's show at foreignaffairs.com. The Foreign Affairs Interview is produced by Kate Brannon, Julia Fleming Dresser, and Marcus Zacharia. Special thanks also to Grace Finlayson, Caitlin Joseph, Nora Revenaugh, Asher Ross, and Gabrielle Sierra. Our theme music was written and performed by Robin Hilton. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please take a minute to rate and review it. We release a new show every other Thursday. Thanks for listening.